Tony Martin, John Hopkins, welcome to Froom FM. Nice to be here. Thank you. We saw your amazing drone display uh, on Saturday, October the 30th, and I think it's fair to say that everyone watching, and there must have been well over a thousand people there, I would have thought. I think it was, yeah, it was closer to like 7,000. What? Yeah. You're kidding. No, it was amazing. Oh, right, okay. Well, I got that wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was amazing, and um, it obviously caught the imagination um, you know, for a live experience which no one had ever seen before, probably. I mean, they might have seen the odd film featuring some of your work, but they really hadn't seen it live. And it is, it's a stunning thing. It's, it's just stunning, really. So, um, and it was an amazing thing to discover, as people listening to this might uh, feel amazed by the fact that you actually are based in Froome. Uh, yeah, we feel very lucky to be based in Froome, both... But well, how did that happen? Well, completely independently, John and I moved to Froome about three years ago. And then uh, we crossed paths around uh, just uh, just over 18 months ago, something like that, two years ago. At a Christmas party, mate's Christmas party. Uh, and, our, and our joint across friend... A, I know, across a crowded room. Yeah, very, literally. Almost <laughs> that. In, in fact, it was that. And, and Love our, at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get there. And, uh, yeah, our friend uh, knew both of us independently of one another. And he was aware that we were both, you know, looking... We were both interested in the drone industry. Uh, John had been gestating the idea of Celestial for quite some time before I came along. And I had another drone company already. Right, so you're both into drones at this point. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you know, we've both got backgrounds. You know, I'm, I'm new technology and media. Yeah. And, and John, John's been a successful director, film director for the for last 20 years. Well, let's just, let's just go there then. Um, so tell us a little bit, Tony, first about your, your background. How did you get to be where you are today? Well, I'm old, so therefore <laughs> uh, it's a long list. But just to summarise, I used to be a recording artist making dance music. Um, and then I became a record company executive uh, looking after new technology strategy for Sony Music across Europe. Um, and then I ran a couple of other technology companies, uh, all of their European businesses. And then um, eventually started my first drone company, started playing with drones around nine, ten years ago. Mm. Uh, created my first drone company a few years after that. And what did that do? Initially, for, for flying for films or something yeah, like that? Yeah, initially exactly that, making making films and kind of promos for different clients. And then we moved over, we, we started to get involved with a little bit of um, machine learning and artificial intelligence and started positioning that company as, a, as an infrastructure inspection business. So, for example, working with telcos to inspect their, their telecoms masts around the country. Um, that felt a little bit dry, so I was really happy when John came along because uh, it gave me the ability to kind of get back into creativity and technology. And my whole career has had a thread of, you know, creativity and technology running through it. Mm. Um, and, and so this has given me an amazing opportunity to, to bring those two facets of my career back mm. together again. And yeah, and, and, and here we are now. Now, because just to go back a step, I mean, drones have been, as you say, they've been around probably for 15 years now, uh, but they've taken over from helicopters big time, haven't they, because of the cost yeah, factor it, as, well, as in, much as anything. I mean, you, you've, you've only got to look at your, your TV screen nowadays and you'll see all of these aerial shots that, you know, 10, 15 years ago would have cost hundreds of thousands to, to put up because you, you, you had to go hire a helicopter and, you know, lots of really expensive camera kit. You know, our flying cameras that we have in-house, are they're not cheap, but they're not helicopter. So <laughs> it's, uh, it, the, yeah, the, the, the economies of scale have really kicked in with drone photography and filmmaking. And you, you see, you now see that everywhere. One of our, in fact, one of our cameramen, uh, one of our flying cameramen, a guy called Richard Elliott, was, was one of the flying cameras on the most recent Bond film. So that's the caliber of people we've got working in right. the team. Well, let's talk about those people later. But uh, what about you, John? Where, where do you come from? I always wanted to be a filmmaker from an early age and uh, when I left university started running on film sets for a few years you know earning my crust it was pretty hard work made it quite film. exciting though it was I was thrilling and I that's where I learned my work, work ethic I became I went from worthless to work work <laughs> ethic overnight and um, I, was, I made a, a short film aged 25 or something that got into the Sundance Film Festival and set a film company up off the back of that. 
and you know eventually found myself directing tv ads right you know i did that for quite where a long all the time. great directors come from isn't it yeah which is great you know i cut my teeth i got to work with some of the you know best dps and editors and film crafts people out there but slowly kind of fell out of love with the advertising world um i'm i was very lucky i got finally got to make a feature film which is what I, was my end goal all what, along what was that it's a horror film called slumber which came out a few years ago but i knew i was going to be leaving london and i, I really wanted to have a company out in the countryside um to sort of pour myself into mm. And it was around three, four years ago, and I, I saw the Korean Winter Olympics, and there was a drone display above the mountains there. Oh, right. And it just occurred to me that this, the sky might be the next screen, actually, and that these drones, these pixels, even in this kind of infant stage, would probably evolve into photorealistic graphics in the sky, mm. and that this could be a brand new artistic medium through which to tell stories. And then at the time, I was I was bumping into a guy called Nick Kowalski, who is actually the third founder of Celestial, and his background was as in live events and as a drone engineer. And so, you know, Nick and I looked at each other in the eyes and thought, could we try and set up a drone, you know, use your drone engineering and my filmmaking mm. skills, and could we do this? Mm. And that was the beginning of a long kind of journey trying to figure out how on earth you set up a drone display company and, <laughs> and it was only really when we got to Froome and realized that probably we needed someone to help come on board and drive the business you know that bumped into Tommy just serendipitously and so that was really the beginning of Celestial. It, it is a massive invention this I mean it's culturally a massive invention because it will lead to all sorts of things down the line. Um, how does your technology work? Um, you, you use normal drones, that commercial drones? No. It's quite a complex process. Um, and in our team, we have designers, storyboarders, animators. Um, and then in terms of delivering the show itself, we, we have to go through around 10 different bits of software in order to finally go into the flight control software that in turn controls the drones. The drones themselves are not are not the commercial drones that your listeners may be familiar with, that they may buy off the shelf. Um, they're essentially flying light bulbs. They're designed specifically to be display drones. So they don't have cameras on them. They don't have any of those kind of ancillaries that you might expect. Um, they literally are very good at being in the place that you put them. So they're very accurate positionally. Um, but apart from that, they're a light bulb in the sky. But they use GPS like other drones, do they? We use GPS, but we also have an extra layer of accuracy that we put on top of the G GPS called RTK. So typically, GPS will give you one meter accuracy. RTK will give you 10 centimeters accuracy. Wow. So we just use one layered on top of the other. And that means that when our drones are flying in formation, they do so safely and they avoid collisions and so on and so forth. Yes, yeah, so you don't want them bumping into each other, really, do you? No, and we've got lots of other safety bits and pieces as well. You know, we use these things called geofences, which is essentially a virtual cage that wraps around the whole display, and that prevents any of the drones leaving a designated area. Oh, wow. So they, we, we have concentric geofences, meaning one inside the other. Right. And um, if they hit one geofence, it triggers one behaviour, and if they get through that geofence, which we've tried our best, we can never get them <laughs> to go through one geofence, but if, it, if they hit the second geofence and there's bad luck, then it triggers a different type of behaviour. So that could be a return to home behaviour or it could just be a hold, you know, where they just stay right. put. And then we can go and take control of individual drones. If there's any anything anomalous happening, we can go, we can identify which drone is behaving badly and we can go and fly it back manually. But we've never had to do that. No. You know, the I was going to say, have you had actually had any accidents during a display? We've never experienced anything that that we would see as you know a huge disaster. We, one of the key safety aspects of what we do is we create a sterile area underneath what's called the flight volume. That's where the display happens. So there has to be a sterile area underneath where no members of the public can be, and all of the crew members wear hard hats and all of the stuff, all of that stuff. And in that sterile area, you know, it, it's it's the same in radius as it is the height of the display. Right, because you're thinking so. in 3D all the time, aren't you? Yeah. And I think that's one of the most impressive things about it in the sky, you know, is that it is so three-dimensional. And obviously the way it's designed, it's designed to accentuate that 3D 
effect, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you saw the rotating tree, for example, and then you saw the green man as his face peered from one side to the other. And mm. it's really important that we can kind of you know, orient the, dis- the displays to, to service the the audience that's that's viewing it. So mm. there's a lot of flexibility in that. Yeah. So on Saturday, um, how many people were there from your organisation putting this thing together? I mean, from the taking the drones out of their boxes to wrapping it all up at night. So you have ground crew, you have flight crew, and then you have camera crews. And altogether, I think on Saturday, there are about 45 people from our team there. Wow. So camera crews, do what do they do? Well, John can speak to that because we have an in-house camera unit and because John's our creative director and he's got a background in film, he can probably yeah. talk better about that. Okay. Well, you know, each time we do one of these displays, it's a big effort and it looks fantastic and we want to capture it on film as in the best possible way we can because ultimately each one of these shows is a potential piece of marketing for us. Of course. And because we are filmmakers as well as drone artists you know we're pretty good at capturing this stuff and you know each time we make a really lovely little bit of film about one of our shows that goes out there into the onto the web and you know generates buzz and publicity and we get more work off the back of it can you reuse these uh, sequences we can but we tend not to all of all of our shows are, are custom built for for our clients as they come through the door so what we do for Greenpeace will be completely different from what we do for mm. Amnesty International. Mm. We've just done a show over the Eden Project for the G, uh, for the COP26. All completely different. And, of course, Froome, completely unique because we wanted to, you know, delve into the heritage of Froome. I think you've, you've certainly impressed a lot of people in Froome just by... I know you work here and you're based here, but nevertheless, you know, that's um, a massive thing to do for a town uh, because it involves so much... So many people, so much technology, and presumably so much cost. How, how much would that can cost commercially? I mean, well, that, <laughs> if you that, charge that up, that did, would, did you get a grant for it? We did get a very small grant uh, to support our costs from um, the Arts Council, so we're very lucky with that. But that doesn't even scratch the surface compared to what we would normally charge to a commercial client, which would be in, in the six figures. Hmm. You know, we wouldn't... Uh, we don't want to give too much away, but we certainly certainly didn't make a buck, that's for sure. Uh, mm. And we just, I don't even think we covered our costs, but, but, but that's not the point. The point is we love Froome. And what we, what we aim to do every year, and, and John will speak to this, is you know we want to be able to deliver this kind of show to a town like Froome that otherwise might not be able to afford it. Yeah. So it shouldn't just be big cities around the world we don't just want to do the giant marquee events, the Super Bowls, the kind of Coldplay tours. I mean, we, we want to do those things, but we feel like, you know, we've got this brand new artistic medium that actually generates a really profound emotional response and can have a very unifying effect on people. And we want to, in this post-COVID era, build ourselves out as a kind of responsible, conscious post-COVID business that not you know, not only does these big marquee events, but actually travels around the country, hopefully with money from the Arts Council, doing smaller events that generate the kind of buzz and community spirit that we saw on Saturday Mm. night here in Froome. And we think we can go beyond just doing these kind of shows in the UK. And, you know, we've got grand ideas of like, wouldn't it, what, what would the reaction be if you went to the slums in Delhi and did a show there, not just for 6,000 people, but for Two million people might turn up for that. What would the impact of our show be for those people? Mm. Or going to the, to a shanty town outside of Cape Town, for example, take take it there, take the magic there, and bring people together over there and lift people's spirits. It's all about the message as well, isn't it? Mm. I mean, I thought that the one thing that people seemed to be very impressed about on Saturday was the fact that uh, you had children performing. Uh, reading material, you know, whether it was recorded or live. I, can't, I couldn't see whether it was recorded or live. But, I mean, there are nevertheless children involved in very ethical kinds of conversations that w- that you were having with the audience. And I think that's very impressive. And obviously, you know, it's impressive enough to look at, but if you can also uh, understand something through it, I think that's a terrific, mm. you know, that's a big bonus, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, we've always been strong on bringing in other creative voices. So we launched this company essentially when we did our first show 
uh, last New Year's Eve for Hogmanay up in Scotland. And for that, we, we, we had the poet laureate, writer poet, the Scottish poet laureate. We had people like David Tennant, the actor, reading the poem for us. We commissioned some music specifically for the piece. And it was drawing together all of those creative inputs that made this show that was so emotionally engaging. You know, it was bringing grown men to tears all over the world. We had amazing reports back, you know, from from everywhere from, you know, very local to kind of literally the other side of the planet, didn't mm. we? Mm. There's something about using local talent to help us build these shows that makes it resonate for that one show in that yeah. specific place. Yeah, you know, and, we're, and, we're, and we're kind of starting to build a formula now where we, we, even if we're doing shows around the world, we, we, we want to work with the local talent there. We want to tell their story using this new medium for that audience mm. over there. Mm. You know? Let's just look at the the commercial side of this because you've done quite a lot of work. I don't know whether you'd call it commercial, but you have done a lot of work for big organisations and you've had commercial sponsorship to do that. Just tell us a little bit about, um, say, the, the Greenpeace one and, that, and also <coughs> the difference between what that is and, and what we saw on Saturday night. Actually, there isn't much difference in the process between what we might do for Greenpeace versus what we did for Froome the other night. I think one of the key differences is that, you know, we had the budget to have more cameras and we could kind of, the filmed output became more significant because that was the brief. But uh, in terms of the process, how we, you know, develop the ideas, turn it into a script, storyboard it and then animate it. The, the processes mm. are really quite similar. But there's an extra layer, isn't there? Because you, you have a filmmaking process as well, which is the backgrounds to the actual drone activity. Mm -hmm. So you have to go on location to do that. You went to Cornwall, I think, didn't you? That's for right, that one. Yeah. Well, How does that work? Because that's, that's an additional expense. I mean, you know, you're talking big money there too. And, you're, and your production standards are very, very high, aren't they? Yeah, well, it just goes back to that thing. You know, that's kind of where we've come from. And we want to, you know, bring that top level production value that has been established in the filmmaking heritage at Celestial into what we do for the drones. But any any film we make of our drones has to have that standard. And we want to set the benchmark globally mm. for how drones are filmed, you know, and there's no reason not to bring all of those skills we've learned in, in our filmmaking journey into how we put these films together. Mm. You know, so for for example, for Greenpeace, we had location scouts finding us all these beautiful locations. You know, we're making sure to to use the top drone pilots in the world in the in the country to film it all for us, and using top editors and visual effects people to come on board in the post production. Is it easy yeah. to find drone operators? Um, it's yeah, you know, we, we we've now tapped in as as John mentioned, we've tapped into this kind of you know, upper echelon of really great drone cinematographers who've, you know, if they're doing things like James Bond, then they've got to be pretty close to the top of the pile, mm. right? Um, so we, we feel that uh, we're, we're incredibly fortunate to have found those people. Um, and, you know, touching on your previous point, yeah, there is a there is a film budget. Um, we have the, the one budget that is to build and deploy the show and create that animation and make the drones fly. And then we have a separate budget, which is, you know, just for the, the making of the but, film. But, but what we, the, we see it as this, you know, when, when someone's spending a couple of hundred grand on us building a show for them, it seems silly for them not to invest a little bit more and to have a lasting memory of that show that they can then leverage into their ongoing marketing for that year. Mm. So a, a drone show in and of itself is quite ephemeral. It just it happens yeah. the once. Yeah. But if there's a really great filmed record of that, they can just keep getting value out of that investment in right. the show across the entirety of the next financial period. And that makes more sense. So how do you film a show then? Because uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of people who've done it on their iPhones. <laughs> mm. It still looks pretty good on there. But I mean, how do you film a show and how many cameras would you have on it? Well, it's how much we can You only afford. have one angle, don't you? Yeah. I mean, we, we love our aerial cameras. Tony flies one of the aerial cameras usually. So you have, them, you have drones with aerial cameras yeah, covering it as well? Yeah, to give us these beautiful helicopter shots, you know, big dramatic tracking shots through the air that gives, you know, just a beautiful sense of movement and scale and, you know, context for the show. 
And then we have lots of ground cameras dotted around, giving us angles from the ground. And in the case of Froome on Saturday night, we wanted to place our cameras in the crowd so that we could get a sense of the crowd in the frame as well as the show beyond it. Because we yeah. really want to start wherever possible using our shots in a film to connect audience to the drone show. You know, a lot of films of drone shows in the past, you just see the drone show. You know, for us, it's about how do we how do we get that connection between drone show and audience? And actually, we've got lots of ideas that really do connect an audience physically using a smartphone to what's happening right. in the show itself in an immersive way. Yeah, See, that, that's to come. We've got a lot of stuff in our innovation pipeline where lots of technology means that either artists are going to be able to interact with the drones as they fly or audiences are going to be able to interact with the drones as they fly. That's all kind of in the pipeline. That's sort of virtual reality kind of area, is it, um, in terms of design? We, we are looking at augmented reality. So with some of our shows, we want, because everybody's got their camera phones out anyway, we, we think, well, why not? If, the, if, they've got their, if they've got their phones out, why not create an, aug an augmented reality piece so that when they're holding their phone up to the drones in the night sky they can see a little bit more information. Mm. An example that might be dinosaurs, for example. If we're flying dinosaurs, it'd be a great educational resource for you know the kids to hold their phones up and then see a little bit more information about mm. the dinosaur that they're seeing made of drones up in the sky. That's a kind of an augmented reality piece that we're adding. Mm. But actually more directly, you know, it could be the way the audiences move their arms in a show, you know, if they jump up mm. and down, or it could be the way a performer moves on stage. All of those things we're... We're, in, we're attempting to build linkages mm. between the performer or the audience mm. and the drone swarm above them. It's Because it seemed to me that the, the most exciting thing about, about it was that you were experiencing this three-dimensional event in the sky above you. And I think, you know, and then I, because I, I had my camera, because I take my camera everywhere, you know, and I started filming it. And then I thought, no, actually, I really just want to see it in the sky, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, I know, but it's the sad thing at many many concerts at the moment. People uh, s they don't look at the people on stage anymore. They look at their phones, which is looking at the people on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's we, yeah. We want to. I mean, one of one of the things that we talk about a lot is you know, in the world that we live in right now, a lot of people spend time looking down at their phones, and we want people to look back up again at the sky. And engage because it kind of opens people, you know. When as soon as they're looking up and they lift their gaze from their pocket technologies, it's just, as John says, you know, it's a shared sense of wonder, isn't it, John? We sort of feel like actually what our medium is is the stars. We feel like we're bringing the stars to life, and on a kind of deeper philosophical level, what we really want to do is is get people to look back up at the stars and um, feel what we used to feel as cult indigenous cultures, you know, with a relationship to the stars and the universe beyond and an innate sense of belonging that emerges in each of us mm. on a subtle level when we start to do that again. You know, we've had our heads down for so long that we've kind of grown into a sense of isolation and alienation in the kind of divided world. But you look back up again at the stars and you start to, on some small level, feel a sense of belonging. It's, it's funny also that, you know, there was this this shared sense of reverie. You know, there were definitely moments in the Freedom Show where people were cheering and clapping and stuff, which was lovely. But something that someone pointed out to us recently, there were also these moments of wonder where everyone was quite silent because they were looking up and they didn't know what was going to come next. And that was really lovely, you know. The, and that, that, that's the, the shared sense of wonder we're talking about, mm. where everyone is almost dumbstruck by what they're seeing and they're completely engaged mm. and it's just un, it's unfurling in front of them and that it, we don't have enough of that no. as a society no. you know where we're sharing an experience and everyone's feeling the same about the thing that they're looking at it's a really mm. lovely thing to see i think but it is very expensive to produce and um you know it's always going to be quite expensive to produce well yes and no i mean certainly you know let's let's think about i don't know um, any any technology you can think of, you know, from computers to cars to, to whatever it is, it, initially that stuff always costs a buck, right? And it's always, you know, early adopters pay through the nose for those devices and so on and so forth. And it's not too different with this technology. And we expect that, uh, you know, right now, 
yeah, it's it's a city scale project. You know, if you're London or Sydney or wherever in the world, you'll pay for a company like Celestial to put a drone show on for you, and it will cost because it's difficult and it's labour intensive and it's novel technology. Give it another three or four years, though, and there'll be a couple of guys in a transit van, and they'll be doing Lucy's twenty-first birthday party, right? Okay, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Uh, are there, is the technology changing much? Uh, you know, in terms of the drone technology, is that is that still uh, cutting edge and not moving anywhere, or is it is it getting is it changing? It's and not, obviously, it's had to be being used more by different kinds of people, but. Hmm. It's it's not changing quickly enough for us. What would um, you like to see happen to well, it? Well, we you know I mean without getting too technical, there are as as we move towards a world where we're having audiences and performers interacting with the drone swarm, we're finding that the drone swarm technology itself cannot facilitate that. So what we're doing is we're both we're creating both software and hardware that will enable that to happen. And right now, you know we. We connect to the drones with Wi-Fi. There's a Wi-Fi access point on the ground, and it speaks to hundreds of drones. What will happen, and what we're what we're currently prototyping, is that every drone becomes a Wi-Fi access point, and that gives greater accuracy, more resilience, and it means that the the whole swarm, the bigger it gets, the more stable it gets. Mm. Right now, with existing technologies, the bigger the swarm gets, the more challenging it is to get the signal to those drones and make them behave in the way you expect. Right. So we are developing both software and hardware to um, help move the industry forward and to mm. do some of the exciting things that we've got planned. So Wi-Fi is absolutely critical to this. Uh, are there any kind of um, uh, climate restrictions? You know, I mean, can, can you do this in the rain or, uh, you know, what... what what could hold it up? What could I just stop it from really happening? just think fireworks? I mean, if there's too much wind and too much rain, it's it's not going to happen. Right. Essentially, mm. we've got weather limits. We keep a close eye on the weather. We were very lucky with Froome. We mm. had a little bit of rain blow through a couple of hours before the show, but we we've got all sorts of uh, access to meteorological data, and uh, we we look historically back ten years, look at that data, and then we obviously have you know multiple bits of kit that are looking at yeah. weather as it as it rolls through right. but one thing somebody's asked me several times is why was the show so short but again i would point you towards fireworks i mean your average firework display is going to be between five and ten minutes you know people don't hang around the whole night just watching fireworks go off um but we do have some technical limitations you know we we have battery life to consider but more than that, actually, we, we are limited by the numbers of points there are on a, an animation path. And each we, we're limited right now to 8,000 points on a path. So, so one, that's 8,000 transitions from one position to another. Yeah, so, what, what, well, actually, it's the points on a path as it makes those transitions. Oh, gosh, right? right, okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the current limitation. And that means that, and we're working on this, that's, that's why I say that, you know, we want to develop software and hardware. But we, we're working on making that a non-issue. But right now, you know, 8,000 points essentially translates to eight minutes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's very but, interesting. But we, we can do things, you know, you can, have eight, you can have 100 drones flying for eight minutes and you can have another 100 dark and then taking off and replacing them. You can, okay. you can extend so you can them. can extend shows. it, yeah. Well, I yeah, mean, what about um, Edinburgh 2020? You did a fantastic show there. Um, how did, how was that? I mean, how many drones did you have for that one? 150 drones. Right. How know. many did you have on Saturday? A closer to 300. Wow. Yeah. So we doubled up, and that allows us to do kind of more three-dimensional shapes and objects. Just more, it's just more on your palette to work with. But yeah. Edinburgh was was pretty phenomenal. Yeah, and it was a good. You know, it was. It was. I mean, it was a baptism of fire. We we went up to Edinburgh. We flew these drones in the middle of December on the side of a lock. You know, with a lot of pressure from Scottish government to deliver something, you know, they'd spend a lot of money on during COVID that probably could have gone to the nurses or something, you know, but good on them for sort of sticking with trying to create something to lift everyone's spirits on New Year's Eve. And, you know, Scotland and Edinburgh are famous for that. And, you know, I think they were overwhelmed by the response that they received from the, f the three films we made. And, you know, it really captured the imagination and I think did a lot of good. Mm. I think, I think we, we, yeah, I mean, it, it, it went global. 
within a couple of weeks, we had had 12 million views of those films, wow. 165 news outlets around the world, 50 countries around the world, exposure to 2 billion people. And a really great example is, you know, we, had, we even had a high security jail from South America get in touch with us. Some staff members there had seen the material that we'd done. And they said, oh, can you please send over a DVD? Because obviously the inmates aren't allowed internet access. We sent over a DVD recording of, of those three shows. And we had grown men crying in a high security jail in South America. And this is for a Scottish story. You know, we were amazed. But we, we really felt encouraged that we'd gotten that emotional engagement happening, mm. that you could kind of have this effect on people on the other side of the right. world. It was, it was really amazing. It, see, it's interesting because holography was a big thing a few years ago and, um, and it was used in various pop concerts and things like that. But that doesn't really seem to have moved anywhere. But this, uh, th this has really grabbed people's imagination. Well, it's funny you should talk about you know, holograms and scrims and screens and stuff. Because, John, you want to talk about that? Well, yeah, our next, we're doing a big show down in Australia next year that will involve holographic screens as well as our drones in the sky. Um, so that's something we're, you know, we're always looking to see how we can augment our drone displays with other bits of lighting technology and filmmaking, you know, tricks mm, mm. to take the, the, the medium to another level. In Australia, we're... we're we're engaged with the indigenous communities, so we have right. lots of indigenous contributors that are helping us, you know, build out that show uh, for um, for the Adelaide Fringe Festival. But you know, in in terms of just going to places like Ayers Rock and uh, or Uluru is is the is the indigenous name for that now. We 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 can't just go there and plonk our drones there. Of course, what we have to do is engage with the indigenous yeah. community. And, and work with them to figure mm. out the most respectful way of kind of in integrating our technology into their amazing, mm. you know, uh, millennia old storytelling. Uh, you know, that word of mouth, that, 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 that kind of oral tradition they've got. Mm. Uh, and we just need to be very, very careful about how we couch what we do and how we, you know, respectfully engage with those communities to make sure that the output is amazing. Mm. But it's great to, to hear that you are ethical. I mean, so many companies, you know, tech companies have invented stuff that has destroyed people and, you know, that are not used in the correct way or, or an advantageous way for, for people. And you seem to have a, a, a driven desire to make it uh, ethical. Well, I think undoubtedly technology can be used for good. You know, I mean, I think it's very easy just to fear technology and, and blame technology for things. And yes, you know, technology often gets used irresponsibly and technology is advancing so quickly that it's hard to police it you know quickly enough yeah um, but here we are with we are a technology company even though we're artistic and we feel a responsibility as a new company to use our technology for as much good as is possible we've we've set up a an humanitarian division of the company called right. human support and what we want to do you know, we've got these beautiful artistic creations that we that we build and we we put out for clients and and cities around the world. But what we want to do is create a system whereby we can launch drones into the sky as digital signage, and we can steer people away from danger and towards safety. So it may be that there's a bushfire raging, and we can just put a sign up that says "evacuate now" and give people an arrow which way to go. Mm. If all other communications mechanisms are w down, would that be a sort of package you could send to people in a yeah. suitcase almost? Yeah, more or less. I mean, a big flight case, and we would work with an NGO on the ground mm. so that they could just lay the drones out, and then we could fly them even remotely from another country. Yeah, sure. So that's yeah. those I mean, are the sorts of initiatives that we're really interested. They in. sort of do that with community radio in some countries. Mm -hmm. There are you know travelling suitcase radio mm -hmm. stations. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. All right, when can we see the next live event in Froome then? The next live event in Froome, we've got to we've got to share it out equally. <laughs> what we have to do is you know we do want to bring these shows to smaller communities, both around the country and around the world. You know, we just underline that fact. We want we want places to see this stuff that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford to do that. But of course, we're a commercial company, right? So we can only do that a certain number of times a year. And, I, you know, we love being here. We will always do whatever we can. 
to you know fly the flag for free. I, I was joking, really. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it, certainly you've done a huge thing for Froom, and, and uh, just I would love to thank you very much for doing that. Well, Pleasure. thank you. Yeah. Well, Froom's given us the company. Really, we found That's... everything we need and all the people we need. I was going to say it was a big to, thank you for that. Yeah, wasn't it? to bring this idea to life, you know. So we wanted to give back. Yeah, almost every staff member, almost every team member has come from Froom. That's a strong, which is astonishing. It's crazy, you know. When we, when we were first, even even when we were first looking at creating the brand for the company, John and I thought, oh well, we'll have to kind of go to a branding agency in London or at least maybe Bristol, possibly Bath. You know, we were kind of thinking like that. And then we put the word out that we were, you know, creating a brand for the company. And I think we had seven local firms pitch to yeah. do the brand. Yeah. Really the good quality the... branding agency. Yeah, it's, a, it's a amazing who's in Froome yeah. yeah. come out of the woodwork. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah. All right, well, thanks very much for taking part in this and uh, wish you all the best in the future and hopefully uh, we'll see some more of your work soon. Yeah, lots of love to Froome and, and thanks for having us. Thank you.